Before we go into the habits, let's hear a little something from our sponsor. Are you constantly on the go, but still want to expand your knowledge and stay ahead of the game? Look no further than Blinkist. With over 4,500 best-selling nonfiction titles condensed into 15-minute reads or listen, Blinkist gives you the key insights you need from top books in various genres. Whether you're interested in personal development, science, history, or entrepreneurship, dive into the wisdom of the world's most influential authors and thinkers, all at the convenience of your fingertips. Try Blinkist today and unlock a world of knowledge in just a few minutes a day. Expand your mind, stay informed, and make the most of every moment with Blinkist. I'm Lori Gro, your host, mental health therapist, and practice owner. Each month, we showcase a central theme and provide weekly practical hacks, inspiring interviews, and valuable advice from wellness professionals. Our aim is to help streamline your wellness and mental health journey. All right, let's get started. I hope you enjoy the show. today about habits. So this is part two of the habits where I would say it's like a workshop. I want to use it as a workshop. Let's do that. Let's use it as a workshop. I just want you to be able to use this as a way to get yourself moving. I am going to talk today about habits again and this time we're going to be talking about some of those habits that you wrote down, some of those things that you already do? What are some of those habits, good or bad, that you already have in place? And then I want you to figure out what is the cue, what is the craving, what is the response, and then what's the reward. I want you to see if you can grab something like that out. If you, if not, if you didn't do that, you can go back and listen to it. But ultimately, if you have one in mind, you should be good to go. We're going to talk about keystone habits right now. We're going to move into that because I think this is an important piece of the puzzle that we are going to want to make note of. The keystone habits are habits that we do that have a disproportionate impact on overall behavior. So making your bed is one that I find to be a very interesting one because I don't think I've ever made my bed until three years ago. And now I do it every single day, pretty much. And I will do it sort of again later on because my kids are all in there and then we're like getting ready for bed and my bed's all disheveled. I don't know why I just feel so nice to have it made. So at any rate, turns out because I'm making my bed, I'm going to be a millionaire because studies show that people who make their beds in the morning are... 206.8% more likely to become millionaires. So if you caught that, what that means is not that I'm going to actually be a millionaire because that is correlation, not necessarily causation. However, I'm going to pretend that that's going to occur and maybe it'll, maybe it just will because I'm putting it out in the universe. But this is real. This is a real a research study by Randall Bell, and he talks about uh, making your bed having a really huge impact on the rest of your life. So they call it a keystone habit because of that, because it tends to get other things moving. Meditation is like that as well, because if we are doing meditation, We are more likely to be clear-headed. We're more likely to be calm, thereby creating other calm, focused energy throughout the day. We might do that even more. And there it, it builds on itself. Sleeping is another keystone habit is extremely important. One of the things when I'm working with clients, if they're if they're having some depression, I ask them about sleep because it is a pretty clear, it's a clear indicator that depression is occurring. It can also be anxiety, of course, and some other things. But if somebody is not sleeping enough, they don't 
necessarily realize that that affects every single thing else in their life. If you ever change any one thing, change your sleep to get more sleep because it does affect our mood. It affects how much we crave sugar. It affects our driving. It affects how likely we are to be in a car accident or to have another accident. It affects our memory. It affects, I could, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but it, it affects our mood and we don't even know we're sleep deprived. That's what's the most mind blowing uh, part of sleep deprivation is we do not even know we are actually sleep deprived. That is sort of like, you know, when people talk about drunk driving, right? Like that's a, obviously that's a a really, really significant, significantly poor choice, right? We know that, we understand that. We also know that a lot of times people that have a few cocktails don't necessarily know that they're over the influence. So that's why a lot of times you'll see those signs that say buzz drinking is drunk driving because people don't realize really how impaired they are. Same is true for sleep. There are studies now indicating a lack of sleep is just as dangerous as driving under the influence. And it doesn't take that much of a lack of sleep. I'm going to get off that tangent, but going back to the Keystone habits, I want you to really think about if you are going to make some tiny habits, what are some in the area of Keystone habits that could be beneficial? What are some habits that you could do that actually make other things a little easier or make other things better? I do yoga, for instance, and I swear that it impacts a lot of different things in my day. I am so much more relaxed at bed and I get get to just pay attention to my body. My daughter's doing it with me. Sometimes a couple of my sons will be in there. So it's connective. And we had like some really special moments together. Best of all, the rule is no talking. So it is peaceful. It's peaceful and it's with my daughter. I mean, having that combined is a pretty good positive reward, right? So we both feel like that. And then we we have like little snuggles and stuff after. It's pretty great. Anyways, we're going to go into the principles from Atomic Habits now. Anyone that has not read this book needs to read this book. It really lays out a lot of important a lot of important information on how habits are formed and what we can do to increase our likelihood that we will create and maintain habits. There's also the one thing which is somewhat where we are talking about the keystone habits kind of similar concept to that of focusing in on one thing that makes other things a lot easier. All right. Principles from atomic habits that you need to know. By focusing on small manageable actions, we can build on our habits. Case studies highlighting the transform. Oh my goodness. I was not even going to say that one. You don't, you don't need to know it that bad. So if you're basically what we're doing here is talking about focusing in on what are some small things you can do to build on our current habits? What are some things you can do that is small and manageable that can make an, a big impact over a period, a longer period of time? So instead of thinking, I want to lose 10 pounds in three months, you could switch it to, I want to lose 15 pounds in the year. And if you happen to be someone that um, partakes in drinking full sugar soda. If you give up one soda every single day for the year, there's your 15 pounds. It's shifting how we are thinking about habits and thinking about goals and being healthy. That You can do some small things that make a tremendous impact. Another example that they talk about, I believe in Atomic Habits, it would be a plane being off by a degree. Typically, if a plane is driving, driving, if a plane is flying, yeah, they fly. And if they're off by one degree, let's say the pilot accidentally nudges it, nudges whatever button that would be or knob that would be, after one mile, 
they would be off course by 60 nautical miles. So an example would be flying San Diego to Hawaii, you would miss the whole island by 42 miles if you were off course by one degree. Really take that in for what types of things you could really do that would not be painful, but would help you long term. That's one of the main principles. My takeaway from from that book would be that. So I get this question a lot. In fact, I just got this question today. How long does it take to solidify a habit? The verdict is out from my perspective on this. I have read many research articles, many books, and it doesn't quite give me an answer really anywhere. What you might hear is that it could take, a lot of people say it's about 30 days. And I think that that's a pretty solid rule of thumb to say, okay, let's do this habit for 30 days and see where we're at. Meaning not you give up at 30 days, but 30 days, let's see if, if it feels a bit more automatic. Do you have to ask yourself to do the thing? Do you go back and forth about the thing? If you're going back and forth about the thing, it's not automatic. You know, brushing your teeth, for instance, you're usually not saying, should I today? Should I not today? You Usually you're not thinking at all. If you're, you know, in a, in a state of depression, of course, that, that does become part of it, right? But I'm just, I'm talking about a typical day-to-day. You're not going to be in that space of asking that that back and forth question. So it could be 30 days, but it could also be up to a full year. And it really varies on the type of habit you're talking about. And it depends also on how frequent you are doing the habit. So I would also just point out, I would highly recommend doing a habit every day if you're starting it and want to really have it ingrained in your life. Um, Now, I talked about yoga a bit before. Every day won't really work for me. I do it during the week when my kids are at school um, at bedtime. That works to me for me. If it's on the weekend, I'm probably not. I'm not doing it because my my built-in system isn't the same on the weekends. All right, like my kids might have sleepovers and other there might be other things going on. So, but all in all, do it for or do it every day if you want it to be a habit. Be the reason being is you aren't going to have to ask those questions of is today my day that I'm doing it uh, or I'm going to do it next week instead I'm going to start or um, I'm going to go on walks every day or not every day I'm going to go on walks uh, three times a week oh today's raining so maybe tomorrow and then tomorrow's kind of cold and then maybe the next day just eliminate all of that because if you're thinking too much it's going to create friction you're not going to want to do it. It becomes more. So eliminate as much as that as possible. I don't want you. I don't want you thinking at all when you're when you're trying to create a habit. Okay, no thinking allowed. All right. So another thing that I feel is important is talking about some of the challenges that we have when we're making a habit. So often that will re- will deal with resistance and procrastination. Procrastination is going to be another fun topic that I'll talk about on a different day, but I just want to put it out there as is that can sometimes be why, right? Like I just said it before, if I am going to go for a walk, maybe I start my big walking habit tomorrow. Um, I want to talk about the resistance and some things that we can do to reduce resistance or reduce friction with some of the habits. What are some of the common obstacles, right? That is one of the things I want you to pay attention to when you are writing some of this down, right? When you're looking at a habit that you want to do, so think about that habit, what are some of those obstacles? 
one thing that comes up that when I'm working with individuals is language. So you change should to want. We will tend to rebel very strongly with the word should, right? Like I should do my laundry. No, I don't want to. Absolutely no, 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 thank you. We should clean the toilet. No, you, you, no, I, I don't need to do anything. I don't need to do anything. We will legit say that to ourselves. So really great to change that word. It just eliminates that natural tendency that it is innate, by the way, the rebellious piece of us. We will rebel when we are told we should do something. It is something um, with, when I say innate, I, it is about that decision-making piece. So that when I'm saying innate, that's, it means that we want to be able to make a decision for ourselves. So if we're telling ourselves we should be doing something, it's almost like some other something is telling us to, and we're not going to do that. But if we say, I want to do my laundry today so that I can wear this new outfit or I, my favorite socks, right? We're going to, we're going to do that or we have a better chance of doing it. And that's what I really want to see here for you is it just like a better chance that you're going to do that laundry. Um, another part that I find to be really useful, they talk about it in Atomic Habits, but they also, there's a lot of books where they talk about this idea, but just in a slightly different way. And it's the idea of putting something pleasurable with something that you don't like to do. And by doing that, we start to create a positive feedback loop that habit starts to form because we're getting a reward with something that we didn't use to get a reward with. So I'm going to use laundry again um, because that's where I notice this for myself as one of the miracles of creating tiny better habits for my life it was really that I decided to listen to an audio book when I'm doing laundry so I can actually, I can enjoy it. It's quiet. Um, my kids are running around somewhere else and I'm just uh, listening to some probably kind of a trashy novel. I don't know. It doesn't even matter. I'm just, I'm just enjoying it. Right. So pair it with something, right? Pair it with something you like and you will want to do it again. I would do this with working out where I was always, always loving Game of Thrones. So I would not allow myself to watch it unless I was working out. And that creates the feeling of wanting to work out. I don't want to work out necessarily, but I want to see what's going to happen on the next episode. What If I could give you any sort of anything, any sort of advice regarding habit forming techniques, that would be my number one go-to is make it, make it good. Motivation. I want to talk about this as well because we are often told that motivation is what we need to do something. Oh, why aren't, why aren't you eating healthy? today. Just not motivated to do that. Why didn't you go on a run today? I'm just not motivated to do that. Why didn't you clean out the garage today? Um, cause I don't want to do that at all. And pretty sure I'm going to have no clue where anything is anyways. I don't even know how to lift things and put them away in that massive dungeon of a garage. Luckily my husband does. But the motivation piece is random, typically. We can't just harness motivation. To some degree, we can kind of find 
find some things that kind of go into the motivation. Like when people say, well, why do you want to work out? Um, you can say many reasons. I want to look uh, a good. I want to be healthy. I want to be strong. There's many reasons, but that doesn't always motivate us. It can motivate us to start, but it does not typically make us continue on. So we got to think about what other things can help us continue those habits. It's not going to be motivation alone. But I will also point out that motivation does tend to increase if we are getting that reward. So if, you know, going back to the pairing of two things, that's an example of getting dopamine with working out because we're working out. So there's, it's that. But I'm also watching Game of Thrones, a double dose of dopamine. And so that's going to motivate. You know, that's truly what would be motivating about that situation. It's it's not that I want to be healthy or strong. Those are there, but that's not going to get get me there today. It's you know, watching what Jon Snow is going to do. That's what's going to get me to work out today. All right. Next up, willpower. And so this is the last area we're going to talk about today. And that's exploring the science of willpower and its connection to habit formation. Basically, in a nutshell, people have different views on willpower. Look it up. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But what we can say with willpower is that it's probably not a thing. Or some other people say it is a thing, but it's not going to get you to do habits. Or other people say it's, it's a muscle. And so you need to make it stronger. Bottom line is... We're not going to use willpower to get us to our habits. That's not going to that's not going to work for most people to say like I'm doing this, so then I'm doing it. There's actually a very small amount of people that would probably be um, in that category, um, but that's not always going to be the most beneficial way for most people to do a new habit is to just. Do it by willpower. Um, the reality is when they do te- when they do studies on willpower, they'll say like, if somebody's dieting, then they might overspend. And, you know, there's just so much stuff on willpower. And the bottom line is that it doesn't really have much of a place in forming habits the way I'm describing it, which is, to basically do some tricks, trick yourself. You're human. Use the tricks we know about being human and don't feel bad about it. Feel excited and proud of yourself that you are starting a habit. It's not, it's not really easy. If it was easy, then everybody would have all the healthiest habits, right? So that brings me to my last thing I'm going to just say today, and that's to be really gentle and compassionate about your habit journey because we don't need to be negative to ourselves. We hear enough negativity out there. So just say good job. Just say good job to yourself because you need it. We all need it. We can't we can't forget about ourselves in this. We are there doing a new healthy habit and pay attention. Say thank you. I started making my coffee and bringing it back to my coffee. I started making my coffee the night before, and that was a new habit. One of my one of my best friends makes it every night, and I was like, "How do you remember to do that?" I I I will never remember. Right? Negative negative thoughts, right? But I could not fathom how she's remembering to do it. And then she said, "Well, I just do it when I'm." cleaning up after dinner. I'm like, oh, that's why it's because my husband gets that job. Um, But I thought, okay, well, actually, maybe I can link it to um, the dinner time thing. So I 
get my coffee now ready. Usually I'm at an 80%. Usually I can get my coffee ready while I'm getting dinner ready. And I also thank myself. Yeah, I'm a total weirdo. That's for sure. But I do thank myself and it feels really good. And I make a little song and I sing it to myself and I say, thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's weird, but I definitely feel happy and I smile and I'm like rolling my eyes at myself, but I'm making my coffee. And it was something I legit did not think I was going to be able to do, which I don't know, maybe that seems weird, but I thought, how am I going to remember this? And so I gave it some extra oomph and it felt good and I do it. And that's all, that's sometimes all you need. Just tell yourself you're doing a good job. If you want me to sing a song to you, I'm happy to sing a song to you. But most people would prefer I didn't. All right. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Wisconsin Wellness Podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion on all things health, well-being, and living your best life right here in the beautiful state of Wisconsin. Remember, your well-being is a priority, and we're here to support you every step of the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to rate and subscribe to our podcast for more inspiring content on health and wellness. Take care of yourself and remember that your well-being is a journey, not a destination. We look forward to you joining us again next time on the Wisconsin Wellness Podcast. Until then, stay well and stay inspired.